brethren, when I first became a Freemason in 1991, I was told that things don't change much in Freemasonry. Based on my own experiences, I have to disagree. And looking back further still over Masonic history for the last 300 years, I know that Freemasonry has been constantly evolving, just like every other successful organization. So in this talk, I'm going to consider United Grand Lodge's current strategy for the future and why that strategy is necessary. I will examine changes in our membership over the last 100 years, and I will demonstrate that we have not always done it this way. In fact, I believe that we have survived until now and often thrived precisely because we have evolved. I will make the case for Freemasonry to continue to evolve and change, and I will justify that by reference to the nature of evolution itself, to historic precedent, and by the need to connect with our communities and be relevant if we are to attract new members. I'm going to draw on my own experiences as a change manager and my work with other changing and successful organisations, including, and this will come as no surprise to those of you who know me, including the Scout Association. I will finish by suggesting ways in which lodges can manage a change process that will help them ensure their own future. Back in December 2015, United Grand Lodge published its strategy for ensuring that Freemasonry in England and Wales has a strong, healthy and viable future. That strategy starts with a vision of what the Board of General Purposes would like Freemasonry in this country to be like. And it reads, to become openly recognized within our communities as the premier fraternal organization and the society of choice for individuals with high standards of integrity who are seeking fellowship, personal development, social and charitable involvement that satisfies the needs of themselves and their families. The strategy is built around three objectives in the areas of governance, membership and Masonic halls. So we have a strategy and we've all been invited to contribute towards its achievement in various ways. Now I should declare an interest in this work. First of all, in my Prestonian lecture, I called on Freemasonry to follow the example of the Scout Movement, which in this country at least had reversed its declining membership by updating the way the organization works whilst retaining its core values. Scouting has been growing ever since. My second interest is that I've been involved with two of United Grand Lodge's strategic projects aimed at achieving our vision and delivering our strategy. However, I need to say that I'm speaking in a personal capacity. What I'm about to say does not necessarily represent the views of United Grand Lodge or any of its boards, committees, working parties, or indeed any province. At no point in this talk, or in the Grand Lodge strategy, is there any suggestion that we should change our ritual or dumb down the meaning of the Masonic experience, far be from us any such intention. Finally, I'm addressing my points to all of us rather than at any particular lodge or individual, so no criticism is implied at any point. However, I do hope you will consider the issues I raise and respond as you think fit, and perhaps your lodges can put some time aside to discuss the matters raised in this strategy and in this talk, and especially those concerned with membership. Towards the end of the lecture, I will give you uh, a way in which you can do precisely that. So let's now look at the background to the strategy. The membership of our lodges under United Grand Lodge of England, at least, has fallen quite sharply in the last 30 to 40 years. From being well over 300,000 strong, we are now left with around 200,000 individual members. Our organisation, however, uh, developed its governance, its infrastructure, its cost base, the number of its lodges and indeed its Masonic halls to reflect that higher membership. For example, as the graph shows, 
between 1920 and the early 1970s, the number of lodges doubled. The rate of growth in lodges slowed in the 1990s, and today our total membership is back to what it was, back to around at least what it was in 1920, but the number of lodges has not reduced in proportion. So we are left with more lodges than our membership can sustain, and many of those lodges are getting weaker. If we were to put this in business terms, we would say that the market is flooded with supply, but demand has shrunk. Just as in business, the danger is that the suppliers, in this case our lodges, will reduce quality to compete for customers, in this case our new members. Despite the overall fall in membership, some lodges, however, are thriving and growing. And ac across this country, Freemasonry is proving very popular among young professional men, especially where it has the means to become a regular part of their social lives. Young members groups are especially successful in this respect. And United Grand Lodge of England researched the difference between struggling and thriving lodges, and we used those findings when we developed the members pathway. This fall in membership, however, has affected our attitudes. There is a widespread view that Freemasonry as an organization is in difficulty. However, when we last had 200,000 members in the 1920s, we were then recognized and respected by the public and we were then perceived as successful. We'd certainly achieved our 2020 vision in 1920. So perhaps we are comparing ourselves too much with the boom years of the 1960s. And that, of course, would be natural. It's within living memory. However, if we do not develop a sense of optimism, we will not make the changes needed if we are again to be recognized, respected, and attractive. And attractive. After all, brethren, nothing positive can come from negative thinking. So perhaps we should consider the post-war rise in membership as having the effect of a tidal wave. It created a temporary increase, but it did not shift our underlying members. So this brings me to evolution. Charles Darwin observed that all populations change over time. His theory of natural selection explains why some groups within populations thrive while others fail. Essentially, small variations between groups Essentially, small variations between groups result in some being favoured over others in the struggle for limited resources. Darwin himself said, there is one general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely this, multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. Perhaps a more familiar quote is by Medjinson, who said, it's not the strongest that survive, nor the fittest but those best suited to their environment and best able to manage change. Now, if we apply these points to Freemasonry, then perhaps we should realize that Freemasonry is just one organization that a man might choose to join. Equally, he has plenty of lodges to choose from. Each of those lodges has to attract its offer and has to make its offer attractive to that man. Evolution also tells us that we cannot expect all of our lodges to survive, only those that are willing and able to adapt to their changing environments. Now, currently, we have around 2.7 million men in our country regularly giving time to clubs, societies, and organizations that are related to hobbies, social activities, and recreation. Do we have a fair share of this market? Are we becoming more attractive or less? Have we introduced small variations that are favorable to men making a choice of which organization to join? Or are we resisting evolution in our quest to maintain those traditions and practices that favored the lifestyles of our forebears, but which are no longer relevant to today's man? Brethren, if we resist evolution, we will die. 
we must be willing to make those small variations over time in the hope that they will be relevant and will find favor with today and tomorrow's man. Back in 2016, I watched a television program in which the popular entertainers Ant and Deck followed the Prince of Wales for a year and observed his work with the Prince's Trust. His Royal Highness had formed the Trust in 1976, shortly after leaving the Navy. And in the following 40 years, it had grown to become a highly respected organization, offering young people from difficult backgrounds the opportunity to make a good life for themselves. In one interview, either Ant or Deck, and to be honest, I never know which is which unless they're standing side by side, one of them anyway asked His Royal Highness about the future for the Trust. And he replied that it would be wrong to continue doing things that were right a few years ago just because they worked then. The trust, he said, must evolve if it is to survive. It must adapt to continue to be attractive and relevant. They're his words, not mine. Incidentally, brethren, if you don't know who Ant and Deck are, let me explain that they are two of our most popular entertainers around today. They were born the same year as the Prince's Trust was founded, and they have been on our television screen since the late 1980s. They seem to me to be much loved by the public at large, and they have their fingers on the pulse of our country today. If we don't have at least some understanding of the world as experienced by today's men in their early 40s, we may well struggle to attract those men to Freemasonry. So this brings me to change. Let's look at the changes in the world outside of Freemasonry in the last 40 years. And incidentally, it's over 40 years since I left home. It's, sorry, it's just over 40 years since I left home and went to university. So 40 years is an interesting time frame for me personally. Certainly family life is very different now. Today, men are expected to take a full part in bringing up the family and in helping in the home, and rightly so. In today's families, it is likely that both parents are working, if there are two, and they're probably working very long hours too. With increased social mobility, many families don't have the local support structures of the extended family to help them. Today, single sex organizations have to justify their existence. They are the exception rather than the norm. And in addition, fewer people would profess to have any religious conviction, although there is perhaps an increased interest in spirituality. In the last 40 years, there's been a growth in anti-establishment thinking and a rise in individuality and unique expression. The popularity of body art is just one example of this. The consequence of these many changes is that a smaller proportion of the adult male population is likely to be available for Freemasonry. Certainly fewer might perceive it to be for them, unless, of course, we become more visible and better recognized. The growth in the range of leisure activities and opportunities then mean that we have to compete with some very attractive pursuits if we are to bring good men into the craft. Remember, evolution tells us that it is those best suited to their environment and best able to manage change that survive in competitive circumstances. Our lodges must rise to this challenge. Now, brethren, being an optimist, let me remind you that 2.7 million men in England spend time as a member of a club, society, or organization. Back in 2012, United Grand Lodge of England commissioned a report by the Social Issues Research Center which found that a quarter of men surveyed would consider joining Freemasonry, being attracted by belonging to a group that served its community. And the director of that body said at the time, despite the many changes taking place in society, or perhaps because of them, our desire to be part of something and to help other people is undimmed. It's here that Freemasonry has an important part to play. So what then has changed in the craft in the last 40 years and in the last 100 years? 
While I've already explained the tidal wave effect of increased members following the two world wars and how over the last 40 years or more, our numbers have returned to what they were in 1920. Internally, there have been changes in our rules, procedures, structure and communication. Our book of constitutions has evolved to accommodate the law, external regulations and technology. And therefore, many of the procedures we are now asked to follow have also had to change, requiring lodge officers to have new skills. New lodge offices have also been introduced. First of all, charity steward and more recently lodge mentor. In 2003, the Metropolitan Grand Lodge of London was formed, bringing the lodges within five miles of Freemasons Hall under its jurisdiction. Masonic bodies can now communicate directly with their members using email and other digital technologies. If we look at Freemasonry from the outside, we've also seen a change in the public's perception of us. In 1920, Freemasonry regularly appeared in the local and national press, and we were then seen in very favorable terms. The program master of the time, the Earl of Amptill, was regularly seen in Masonic dress at public events. The president of the Board of General Purposes, Sir Alfred Robbins, who was a journalist himself, ensured that we had a very positive relationship with the media. Freemasonry in 1920 was visible, was recognized and was respected, just as we wish it to be now. However, in the 1930s, we went underground. With the rise of Nazism in Europe and its threat to Freemasonry, we hid. Unfortunately, we did not come back into the light again until very recently. For many years, we avoided contact with the press. We stayed silent when criticized. Our silence created a perception that we had something to hide. As suspicion grew, we lost respect. Brethren, the more you read about Masonic history, the more you realize that the craft has always evolved with the times. The Grand Lodge and its constituent lodges have had to adapt in response to outside and inside influences. I will briefly outline just two examples. In 1799, an unintended consequence of the proposed Unlawful Societies Act threatened to outlaw Freemasonry. A delegation comprising the Grand Masters of the two English Grand Lodges and representatives from the Grand Lodge of Scotland met with the Prime Minister, William Pitt, who was not a Freemason. They agreed changes to the bill to exempt Freemasonry from its scope. However, they had to concede measures to ensure that Freemasonry would not be hijacked by the seditious influences that the bill sought to restrict. And some of those measures survived until the 1967 Criminal Justice Act. More recently, following the Equality Act 2010, United Grand Lodge introduced other adaptations to ensure that Freemasonry continues to comply with the law. You will find further examples in your Lodge Minutes or in the articles in Freemasonry Today by very worshipful brother John Hamill. In the latter, John explains how things we might assume have always been done in a certain way have actually evolved and developed over Freemasonry's history, often in response to outside influences. Brethren, I've been fortunate enough to visit two of the three surviving time immemorial lodges that together formed the first Grand Lodge in 1717. Let me assure you, they do not keep to the practices they adopted then. Whilst retaining some of their traditions, they have adapted and evolved over time. And whilst today they are very efficiently run lodges, providing free very meaningful Freemasonry to their members. Many other lodges that arose in the 18th century and indeed many other fraternal organizations have long since died simply because they did not evolve. Today, many lodges have resisted the call to evolve and seem unwilling to change. Their approach might have been relevant to candidates from 40 years ago, but that will not attract or retain today's man. These lodges are like the ostrich that puts its head in the sand to avoid reality. 
Well, brethren, Freemasonry cannot do that. Collectively, Freemasonry has to face the facts. And if we refuse to do so, we may well deprive future generations of the opportunity to belong to a particular lodge or even to Freemasonry at all. Perhaps one reason such lodges have resisted evolution and change is that when we hid from the public eye, we also lost our ability to sense the impact of wider change and develop incremental responses. In other words, we became an island detached from the wider world. We froze many of our practices and traditions and we perpetuated them unaltered. We then began to believe that we've always done it this way when history tells us that this is rarely, if ever, true. One reason that is often given for resisting change is a respect for tradition. Now, brethren, I love tradition and I enjoy many of the traditions associated with our country and its institutions. In fact, a love for tradition has been one of the reasons I've joined some of those organisations. Equally, I believe that tradition is a wonderful servant, but a very poor master. G.K. Chesterton called tradition the democracy of the dead. In other words, if we allow tradition to determine our future, then we would be allowing our predecessors to have a bigger say in our affairs than our current members. Well, brethren, our predecessors made their decisions based on the situation in their time. They could not be aware of the needs and issues that our members face today. So it seems to me far better to allow tradition to evolve. And one way for each generation, one way to do that rather, is for each generation to make its own contribution to tradition. Past traditions can be reviewed, and if they stand in the way of our future health and strength, they can be adapted or removed. This approach has served many of our long-standing institutions, including the monarchy, the City of London, and our older universities. In fact, it has served them very well indeed. In fact, allowing traditions to evolve is precisely what happens in our most successful older lodges. Brethren, today I believe we have to reconnect with the world, to become sensitive to wider social influences and evolve our organisation so that the way we operate is relevant and is attractive. We can change many things without losing our purpose and meaning, and certainly without altering our ritual. If we don't evolve and change, as natural selection tells us, we will die, just as so many other lodges and fraternal organizations did in the 18th and 19th centuries. Brethren, I've made a case for the craft to evolve and change, and I've justified this by reference to natural selection, to historic precedent, and by the need to be relevant if we are to attract new members. The question, of course, is how do we change? Well, nationally, the Scout Movement offers us a template. In that organisation, when considering major changes at the end of the 1990s, we spent considerable time consulting our members and listening to what they told us. Then we fed back to them the results with the United Grand Lodges online surveys and with local and national discussion forums, Freemasonry is doing exactly the same. Scouting concluded that its core values should not be altered. Freemasonry has done the same, although it is suggesting that we use contemporary language when talking with those outside of our membership. To be clear, no one is suggesting any change to our ritual, to its meaning, or to the nature of the Masonic experience. Scouting also concluded that the way that the organization operated, recruited, trained, and communicated with its members and with the public needed to be radically updated. I believe we are currently going through a very similar process in the craft. So, for example, the Members' Pathway offers tools and techniques developed by thriving lodges for use by all of us. We now communicate direct to all of our members who register for our websites 
and were making extensive use of social media, which is the primary communication method used by people under 50 years of age. We will soon see changes in our structure and our book of constitutions. Solomon, United Grand Lodge's online repository of a growing number of credible Masonic learning materials, now offers everyone the chance to learn about their Masonic interests at their own pace. Our four central charities have consolidated into one organization, partly to simplify its operations, to become more efficient and effective at applying their resources, but also in order to be better recognized and to have a bigger impact within the charity sector. Freemasonry in England and Wales at least is going through its most extensive change in at least 100 years. All around this country, provinces are responding to and in many cases leading these changes and developments. And that is happening more so possibly in our overseas districts too. When new initiatives are set up, Freemasons drawn from around the country are recruited to their working groups. National conferences are held for, for provincial and district secretaries, almoners, charity stewards, mentors, communication officers, and membership officers. Provincial and district grand masters and grand superintendents are consulted on major developments and they approve them before they are launched. Pilot studies are run that include provinces and lodges from across the constitution. So how do we change in our lodges? How do we manage it at lodge level? Brethren, all those who have studied the management of change agree that successful change resulting in something that thrives requires careful planning, consultation, and the involvement of many, as well as regular communication with all. In Freemasonry, we have the added requirement to maintain harmony in our lodges. So I offer you a process that you can choose to follow that can deliver all of these results if it's done well. And this process is in a series of nine steps. Now, brethren, I won't go through the steps in detail on this lecture, but I will upload for you a copy of the nine steps with a few brief notes, a one page document. I'll upload that in the chat area um, after or during the Q&A and, and uh, after the lecture. There's also a copy available as a download on my website. So the steps are briefly listed on the slide there um, and uh, they're explained in more detail on the download that you'll get later. Brethren, just as change for the sake of change is foolish, so is remaining static for the sake of remaining static, as if preserving practices that are no longer relevant could ever sustain us in the future. If tradition is the democracy of the dead, then as guardians and stewards of our lodges, we have a duty of care to cast our vote to ensure their future. We live in a crucial time in Freemasonry. Many lodges are showing that it is possible to change the way that they work whilst retaining our purpose, values, and the special nature of the Masonic experience. Our Grand Lodge is asking us to evolve and change, and it's now up to us to do so. The alternative is not something I wish to contemplate. So, brethren, thank you again for inviting me to address you, and thank you for doing me the courtesy of listening to what I have to say.